Can people hear me? I cannot hear anything. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. We can I hear you. Begin? Yes, Richard, we can hear you. Could you share your screen? Okay, okay, then I shall begin. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I've had uh, many nice uh, experiences, uh, mathematical and non-mathematical with uh, Ron and Yuval. So I'm uh, very glad I have this opportunity to help celebrate their birthdays. And I'm going to give a talk uh, with somewhat recreational math flavor about a certain a partially ordered set that is uh, related to the Fibonacci numbers. So first, let me define a more general class of uh, posets and then specialize to this Fibonacci case. So uh, I and B will be uh, integers greater than or equal to two. And I'll define this poset uh, PIB as follows. It has a unique minimal element zero. Uh, each element is covered by exactly I elements. That is I elements lie above each element and there's nothing in between. Uh, the Hasse diagram of the poset is planar. There's no crossing edges. And I'll be drawing my Hasse diagrams uh, upside down from the usual convention with the uh, minimal element at the top. Uh, you'll, I'll explain why, uh, just a matter of convenience, but soon I'll explain why. Um, and then uh, every time we see this configuration in the Hasse diagram, one element and two others that it covers, and these two other elements should be consecutive. I mean, this, this element, remember this element uh, at the, is below these other two because I'm drawing my diagram upside down. So if it covers K elements, uh, the diagram is planar, so these k elements lie you know, in a row, and these two elements should be consecutive uh, elements that are covered, uh, that cover this top element, really the bottom element. Anyways, they should extend to a 2b gon with b edges on each side. So uh, an example should make this definition clear. I'll uh, note one interesting property of these sets although uh, it won't be so relevant for my talk, that they're upper homogeneous. For every element T of the poset, the set of elements greater than or equal to T is isomorphic to the poset. So I'm gonna be mainly interested in the case I equals two, B equals three. So let's see how we construct this poset script F. F stands for Fibonacci. So we start at the unique minimal element, and since I is two, it is covered by two elements. Now, these two elements are, have to complete to a hexagon, so B is three. So we don't have a join at the next level. We just draw the two elements that each of them cover, that cover each of them. Then, uh, now we have to complete this hexagon here. These, this lambda configuration completes to a hexagon. So these two elements will have a join down here. And then we just put in the remaining edges so that every element is covered by two elements. So we get this. And we continue. We see this, these two hexagons here, oops here and here that need uh, completing. And then we just fill in, add extra edges. So every element is covered by, is, covers, is covered by two elements. So in this way, we're gonna get this infinite graded poset called the Fibonacci poset. Well, there's a couple of 
basic properties of these post sets um, that uh, actually we can do just as easily for any I and B that are not special for the Fibonacci post set. The natural question is, ask how many elements are there in each rank? We'll call this number little p i b of n, number of elements of rank n. This top element in the way I draw it is, uh, has rank zero. Well, there's a simple argument um, that uh, first, you may say as a first approximation, every element of rank n minus one is covered by i elements. So that would multiply the total of the number of elements in rank n minus one by i. However, uh, some of the uh, elements of rank uh, n are obtained by uh, completing these uh, bigons. How many bigons are there that need completing? Well, we have to go up b levels to uh, rank n minus b. Uh, if an element uh, covers i elements, uh, on rank n minus b, then it'll give rise to i minus one b gods. i minus one consecutive elements that it covers in the list of these b elements from left to right. So there's i minus one times p i b n minus b elements of rank n that cover uh, two elements. And so we have to subtract off uh, that uh, number in this first approximation. So uh, anyways, we get this recurrence. It's a linear recurrence with constant coefficients. So it has a rational generating function. If we put in these initial conditions, we see in fact that the generating function for the number of elements of rank n is this rational function, one minus i x plus i minus one x to the b. Now, in the case that we're interested in, i equals two, b equals three, this formula specializes to one over one minus two x plus x cubed, which factors in this way. And from this, it's easy to see that the number of elements of rank n is the n plus second Fibonacci number minus one. My Fibonacci numbers are defined. I'm using the initial conditions F1 equal F2 equals one with a familiar Fibonacci recurrence. So this is the first connection of this post set with Fibonacci numbers, but we'll see uh, there's a lot more we can say about it, these connections. Okay. Now, uh, the second. Uh, 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 combinatorial property of these post sets B, uh, P, I, B is to define, uh, we define E of T to be the number of saturated chains from zero to T, the number of paths from this bottom element zero to the element uh, T. So for my Fibonacci post set P of two, three, here's what this uh, looks like up to the first five levels. Each element is labeled by E of T. You see each number E of T is the sum of the numbers that it covers. Three is one plus two. Because every saturated chain from the top to here either goes through here or here, not both. So we get this Pascal-like uh, identity-like uh, returns. Now we can actually say what, uh, well, in fact, you see Pascal's triangle even as a special case when I and B are both equal to two. Our poset is just the product of two chains like this. And these numbers E of T are exactly the binomial coefficients. This array is Pascal's triangle, which is one reason why I draw the zero element at the top. So this looks like the usual way we draw masculine strong. Well, for Pascal's triangle, you know, we have a nice generating function for the uh, number of elements at a given rank n, that's 
one plus x to the n, which we can expand by the binomial theorem. And there's an analog for any i and b. If we fix i and b, tnk will be the kth element from the left in the nth row of PIB. Beginning with k equals zero, so we're using the same kind of indexing as uh, Pascal's triangle. I'll use bracket nk to be e of nk. And we'd like a generating function for these uh, bracket nk's from fixed n that extends the binomial theorem. And uh, I want to ex explain the proof, which is not hard by induction, but I'll state the result. If Q of N is the number of elements of rank N, uh, which we computed earlier by given the rational generating function, it's not hard to see that Q of N minus Q of N minus one is divisible by I minus one. Uh, we'll call that number R of N. And then the analog of the binomial theorem is that this generating function for this uh, number of chains uh, from uh, zero to the kth element of row n is this product. So this is the analog of Pascal's triangle. But we're interested in the case of, of the, I mean, the analog of the binomial theorem. So we're interested in the case um, i equals uh, two and b equals three. And when you specialize, you'll just get this nice product. I'll call this i n of x. The product from i equals one to n, one plus x to the i plus first Fibonacci number. For instance, in n equals four, we get this product. Um, one plus x, one plus x squared, one plus x cubed, one plus x to the fifth, which is this polynomial. Now, as I said, the previous theorem, one can check, specializes to this generating function, binomial theorem, generating function in just the product i and x. Well, for the binomial, uh, Coefficients, you know, people are interested in some of their squares, some of their cubes, et cetera, at a given level of Pascal's triangle. So we can ask uh, the same here for this Fibonacci process. Well, that little vrn be the sum of the rth powers of the coefficients of i and x. This is the sum of the uh, e of t's at the, at the uh, nth level of the Fibonacci triangle. So we'll let V, capital V R of X, be the uh, generating function for these little V R N's. And since in R equals two, we're looking at the sum of the squares at the nth level. Well, I won't give the details, but the recursive structure of this post that F leads to a system of linear recurrences. Uh, and uh, it's easy to see, uh, this is in the general theory of systems of linear recurrences. And this generating function, dr of x, is a rational function. This computation of this rational function is nicely uh, automated by Doron Zeilbrecher and I'll show you some examples. But uh, first we'll can compare with Pascal's triangle, the case i equals b equals two. Uh, in this case, uh, v two of x, the, general, the sum of the squares of n choose k, or sum over k, uh, the generating function is one over the square root of one minus four x. It's algebraic, but not rational. And VRX for R greater than or equal to three is going to be uh, D finite, but not even algebraic. So this is a different, uh, it's always rational, any R. And here's what these uh, uh, G 
generating functions look like up to n equals six. It's easy to understand this one over one minus two x because uh, we're just counting the total number of chains from uh, the bottom zero to a level n. And each element is covered by two elements. So there's two choices uh, at each step uh, creating this chain. These are not so easy to get any kind of intuitive feel for them. There's a simple reason for even this sum of squares having this generating function. And uh, maybe uh, one can say something more explicit about these uh, generating functions. One property that really stands out is that the numerator is the even part of the denominator in terms of even degree. One minus 11x squared plus minus 20x over four. So that's the numerator. Why is that? I don't know. Well, let's look at another uh, nice combinatorial property of uh, this Fibonacci uh, process, which is not uh, in terms of uh, counting anything. Let's look at two consecutive ranks. Here, I'm going to look at these bottom well, two ranks in this drawing. So ranks four and five. Now one can see that it's always going to be a disjoint union of three element and five element posets that look like this. I think of these as sort of string, or these posets are called fences. So they're always going to have nine, three or five elements. And uh, we can look at the order in which they occur, three and five element uh, posets occur. Rather than using the numbers three and five, let me just use two and three, the number of elements in the bottom of these posets. So here, the sizes of the bottom, number of bottom elements of each of these strings is two, three, two, three, three, et cetera. The string sizes, <coughs> it's not hard to see that they approach a limit as n goes to infinity, that is, the kth element, any fixed k, eventually becomes constant as n goes to infinity. In fact, it stable, stabilizes after halfway, that is, uh, for any n greater than or equal to six, these strings will begin one, 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 et cetera, up to this two. So uh, as n goes to infinity, we get this limiting sequence of twos and threes. Okay, what is that? Well, uh, it turns out to be the following. Let's let phi be the golden mean, one plus the square root of five over two. That's why I've used these nice old uh, letters here. And the theorem is that the, this limiting sequence, C1, C2, et cetera, is given by a one plus the floor of n phi minus the floor of n minus one phi. I'm not going to prove that, but uh, it's not difficult uh, using induction. This sequence, uh, these numbers, Cn, uh, have some very interesting properties. In particular, well, if we remove this two at the beginning and call the resulting sequence gamma, C2, C3, et cetera, it's uh, characterized by the, it's a unique sequence of twos and threes, a unique non-empty sequence, that um, is invariant under substituting three for two, and three, two for three. This uh, sequence is known as the Fibonacci word in the letters two and three. And more commonly one uses the letters one and two, zero and one. The Fibonacci word has a following alternative description, which explains why it's called the Fibonacci word. It's a concatenation of uh, words, so finite words, 
given the cursor is laid by the Z1. The first one is three. The second one is two, three. And then the kth word is the concatenation of the K minus second and K minus first word. So you see just uh, analog of the Fibonacci recurrence. So I've written my, this word gamma as this concatenation. Initially three, two, three. Then we concatenate these, this three and two, three to get the next three terms. And we concatenate these previous two terms to get the next five terms. And then the next eight terms, et cetera. <clears throat> One more an interesting property of this sequence that is actually a characterization of it, given that it's a sequence of twos and threes. If we look at the number of threes between each pair of uh, consecutive twos, um, in other words, the lengths of the maximal factors of, of consisting of threes, these lengths would be one, two, one, two, two, et cetera. If we add one to these numbers, we'll get back the original sequence. So this uh, post set uh, P uh, of two, three, or Fibonacci post set F, encodes these Fibonacci words in a very uh, sort of elegant description, in recursive construction. You know, it's different. From this. Fibonacci type uh, recurrence. Now let's look at more closely at these numbers E of T, uh, the coefficients of this polynomial I and X. The numbers that occur in this generalized um, Pascal's triangle corresponding to the Fibonacci poset. Well, the coefficient of X to the M, uh, just by the by definition almost, what it means to multiply this out, is the number of ways to write M is a sum of distinct Fibonacci numbers in the set F2, F3, up to Fn plus one. Right? Where when we multiply this out, we either choose the term X to the F sub I plus one, which contributes Fi plus one to the uh, final coefficient, or doesn't contribute Fi. So the coefficient of x to the eighth in the product one plus x up to one plus x to the eighth would be three. This is three ways to write eight as a sum of Fibonacci numbers of the first five Fibonacci numbers. Now, can we actually see these sums directly from the Fibonacci posa? We know that each uh, the number of paths from uh, zero to T is this, is this uh, coefficient. So each path itself should correspond to one of these sums. And here's how to uh, see this uh, directly. I'm gonna label the edges of my Fibonacci uh, set with the following rule. Well, the edges between line 2k plus 1 and 2k plus, uh, between 2k and 2k plus 1 are alternately labeled by 0 in the 2k plus second Fibonacci number. Then an analogous rule between lines 2k minus 1 and 2k, except the Fibonacci numbers you begin with a Fibonacci number f2k plus 1 rather than beginning with 0. So this is what it's going to uh, look like to uh, rank 4 on the this first rank of the zero in the second Fibonacci number, and the third Fibonacci number is two, the next Fibonacci number is three, five, et cetera. The labels alternate. And uh, on the odd, well, between the even rank and odd rank, they begin with zero. And otherwise, they begin with a Fibonacci number. So we get this edge, simple edge labeling of our Fibonacci poset. And uh, the connection with uh, you know, the 
some of Fibonacci numbers, the combinatorial interpretation, E of t is first of all, uh, for any t, all paths of the saturated chains from the top to t have the same sum of their elements, we call this sum sigma t. And if we look down this chain and look at the Fibonacci numbers, labels that occur in it, ignore the zeros, we'll get the uh, sum of the distinct Fibonacci, different sums of distinct Fibonacci numbers from the set F2 to Fn plus one. So here's an example. Here is my uh, number, uh, my element T at rank four. And this dark, these dark green labels are the uh, labels of a saturated chain. And we'll get uh, three plus two, uh, uh, F3 plus F4. There's a way of writing this number E of T, which is five. So if we take the, well, there's one other chain through T and has the same sum of the labels. And that's the second way of writing five as a sum of Fibonacci numbers uh, using the first uh, five Fibonacci numbers, N plus first level, uh, N plus first Fibonacci number level N. Now, uh, so this is how we, you know, this is very easy to see. This is really just kind of a pictorial way of taking this product of one plus X, one plus X squared, et cetera, and choosing uh, one of the uh, sum ends at each term. But uh, you just have to be careful about you know, which order we write the two sum ends, X squared and one, or one x cubed. Well, uh, there's a curious um, sort of consequence of this uh, labeling of the elements by ET. I've done it here for rank, uh, five, uh, rank five and rank four. Uh, the uh, numbers ET, they'll, they'll be all the numbers from zero to the n plus second Fibonacci number minus two. Because the number of elements of rank n was the n plus first Fibonacci number minus one, but we're beginning with zero. So we get a certain linear ordering of these numbers. And it's easy to say that it's stable. As we go to the next rank, the ordering is preserved. That is 10 is to the left of say uh, eight here. So 10 will remain to the left of eight. <laughs> so in the limit, as n goes to infinity, we're going to get a linear ordering of all the non-negative integers. It's actually going to be dense linear order between any two numbers and another number, or infinitely many other numbers. So what is this linear order? Well, the uh, a little bit complicated to uh, write down the exact description. But so just as a special case, I'll tell you what numbers are less than and greater than zero. And there's what numbers here are to the left of zero and what numbers are to the right of zero. This uh, description uh, uses Zeckendorf's theorem, which says that every non-negative integer has a unique representation as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Well, where some n equal to one is taken to be the second Fibonacci number. I mean, we, both F1 and F2 are equal to one. And we regard F1 and two as consecutive Fibonacci numbers because we're taking one to be F2. So for instance, 45 Zeckendorf representation is F4 plus F6 plus F9. The subscripts have to be non-consecutive integers. And then the theorem is uh, that uh, for any positive integer m, m is curly greater than zero, that is, appears to the right of zero in uh, this 
partial ordering like the following on the non-negative integers, if and only if the smallest Fibonacci number in the second Dorf representation of M has even index. So 45 is curly greater than zero because the smallest Fibonacci number in its second Dorf representation is F4 and four is an even. Okay, now uh, for the rest of my uh, talk, I'm going to give a second proof concerning the generating function for this number V2 of N, the sum of the squares of the uh, ETs at level N, or the sum of the squares of the coefficients of this polynomial. So, but maybe before I do that, uh, I can ask if there's any questions up in there. I see there's a couple of chat. There's a chat question. I wonder if there's a Q analog of this for the coefficient of i n x. Well, that's a yeah. That's a good question. A canonical question for any enumeration. There's a Q analog. This is from Montel. Um, I have not looked at this very closely. I think. The most obvious attempt at Q analogs, I couldn't see anything uh, nice, but I didn't really look at this systematically. And we can do this from PI of B in general, just P23. P32, um, that post out is essentially the number, if you're the numbers ET you get from that is Stern's diatomic, Stern's diatomic array. And I don't know a good Q analog, but it's worth looking at. Okay, so um, um, so now uh, let's look at the second proof of the generating function of V two of n. It had this rational generating function. So I'll give a kind of a more combinatorial proof. Uh, the proof, this original proof, well, I didn't explain it, but it involves linear algebra. So first I need to uh, give a combinatorial interpretation to these coefficients. Well, we already saw, saw it. It's a number of ways of writing. Uh, the, Exponent as a sum of certain distinct Fibonacci numbers. Let's state that in a different way. This bracket n choose k is a number of binary n tuples, such as the sum of ai fi plus one equals k. This, this, I call this a tautological interpretation because it's just another way of restating what it means to multiply out this product. If ai is one, and we're choosing fi, the term at x to the fi plus one when we expand this product. If ai is zero, we're choosing term b. But then that lets us give a interpretation of v2 of n, a common interpretation of v2 of n. It's gonna be, well, i n choose k squared is just a number of pairs of these binary sequences. So the sum of n choose k squared is going to be the number of pairs such that this, they have the same k. So that these sums, a, sum of ai fi plus one is the sum of bi fi plus one. So I want to count the number of such pairs. Uh, to do this, I'm going to uh, define a product of these pairs, a concatenation product. Let's let mn be the sum of all such pairs uh, with n terms, with n columns. If we have alpha in mn and beta in m little m, then I'll just define the product alpha beta to be the concatenation. It's easy to check that alpha beta is an m n plus one, n plus m. I mean, it's not completely trivial because uh, 
these CIs and DIs are getting multiplied by different Fibonacci numbers than they were here. Fibonacci, the indices have been shifted, but because of the Fibonacci recurrence, uh, you can check. Okay. This concatenation is an M n plus M. So that lets me define a monomer, just the union of all of these MNs under concatenation. The identity element of the monoid is the empty pair, which lies in M0. Now, uh, we want to count the number of elements in MN, in the definition of V2 of N. And uh, this is going to be very easy if our monoid is free. And uh, so let's say that a subset G of M freely generates M if every element of M can be uniquely written as a product of elements of G, in which case M is free monoid. If that's the case, if G freely generates M, and we let G of X be the generating function for the number of these free generators, uh, degree n, that is the number of elements that generate in the generating set that have length n, then uh, it's, it's, it's just a very general uh, generating function principles and generating functionology. This generating function for v2 of n, the number of elements in mn is uh, one over one minus generating function with a free generator, number of free generators. Because G of X to the K just generates the number of free generators of degree or length K. This is just standard uh, generating function coming for us. So if we can figure out G of X, we, we, we have determined uh, this generating function. And they uh, will just state the uh, result for, um, for a G of X. One can check that by a sort of tedious but straightforward argument. And M is freely generated by the following elements. First of all, the elements of length one, zero, zero, and one, one. And then we have these two sets of elements. Now, they only differ by interchanging rows and columns. Um, they begin, well, let's look at the top one. It begins one, one, zero, zero, and then alternates uh, columns that are either zero, zero, or one, one. Each star is a zero or one. The two stars in the same column are equal. So these star columns are zero, zero, one, one. They alternate between zero, zeros, one zero, ending with a one zero followed finally at the end with a zero one. Or what you get by interchanging the two rows. So one has to check how hard it all to do that these lie in MN and they cannot be uh, Factored into two elements that lie in uh, the monolith. There's an example of an, one of these free generators. It begins with one, zero, one, zero. And we have this one column, one, one, and then another, and then the final one, zero, zero, one. Um, to say that it lies in the monoid is to say that. Uh, one plus two plus three plus five, the first four Fibonacci numbers is, is, is uh, three plus eight, fourth plus six Fibonacci numbers. And uh, you can check, you cannot factor it uh, further. And then uh, one has to check that these are a set of free generators. Actually, that's a pretty simple consequence of this special property that if we take any element, say, say this in our monoid, if some prefix is also in the monoid, suppose these first three columns were in the monoid, 
then the following elements will also be in the monomer. That's a special property of the Fibonacci monoid that I've defined, which makes it easy to show that any minimal generating set, well, actually, there's a unique one, a unique minimal generating set is free. So now uh, we can do the computation of the generating function for these. Uh, uh, number of free generators uh, of length n. So the zero, zero and one, one will contribute two x to the generating function, two of them of length uh, one. Now suppose we have uh, k columns here of, uh, of stars. Then this total length is going to be 2k plus 3. And the number of such uh, generators, well, of this type at the top will be 2 to the k because each column of stars can be either 0, 0, or 1, 1. We get this factor 2 to the k of length 2k plus 3. And then we multiply by 2 because we have this second. Uh, type of generator obtained by interchanging the two rows. And this sum is just 2x plus 2x cubed over 1 minus 2x squared. And uh, doing the computation gives this generating function. Now, uh, we can try to play the same game, let's say for v3 then, with some of the cubes of the coefficients of i n of x. Well, now we, we can define a monoid just as before. Now it has three, each element is three binary n tuples rather than two. And it's easy to see by the same reasoning as before that it's um, free, a free monoid. But the generators seem very complicated and I don't know how to describe them uh, directly. So uh, that um, you know, could be an interesting problem to look at further. Okay, complicated, the, complicated, but still a regular language, or you think it's not regular? No, it's free. It's a free monomer. Oh, regular language. Um, I'm not sure since it's infinitely many generators. I think it should be a regular language. I haven't thought about that. Good question. So that, <clears throat> that will conclude my talk. There's much further information, generalizations, and uh, Conjectures at uh, this archive uh, site. Uh, I'll just finally say uh, happy birthday to uh, Ron and Yuval. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Richard. Any, any questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, so you have these Fibonacci analogs of the binomial coefficients, uh, and you've looked at the generating function of kind of a row of Pascal's triangle. Yeah. Um, and I guess the squares and so on. Have you looked at the generating function of the central binomial coefficients or the kind of middle vertical line of the poset? No. I I don't think I have not looked at that. Um, For example, it could be an algebraic generating function, maybe, but maybe not. I don't know. Well, it could be all ones. Maybe. Um, 
And so what you did was for I equals two, B equals three. Right? So can you do it the same for general? For the general case? You get nice bisections? Excuse me? Can you get nice bisections? So the original motivation was in the sport that I equals two and B equals three, and then you got the Fibonacci. Yes. And number. But if you do it for general I and B, can you get a nice descriptions also? Well, I, I, I gave this rational uh, uh, generating function. Um, yeah, but it's nice bijection, for example, uh, well, for an arbitrary I and B. Um, I think probably you could. I haven't thought about that. Oh, this arbitrary I and B. And I have not thought about it. So that, that everything is open there. Um, um, the, I only thought about these three very interesting cases. Well, two, two, which is Pascal's triangle. And it's been studied for thousands of years. Uh, two, three, which is this case. And three, two, which is Nairn's diatomic array. Thank you. But uh, definitely you should look uh, some more at these PFIDs uh, and try to generalize some of this. Yeah, I don't know these middle, these middle coefficients. Maybe they're all twos in, uh, in yeah. this case. So simple. But there's lots of good questions to look at. <laughs> Questions? I didn't. I don't want to say I didn't share my screen for this. Uh, see these uh, two. Let me just do that for a second. Yeah, you can see. Uh, it's possible these are just going to be twos all the way down. But in the next rank, we'll get four, right? Because it's two plus two, or oh yeah, oh you're right, four. Well, that's right. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I haven't, I haven't thought of it. Well, it's probably pretty complicated. You know, the number of ways of writing you know, half the middle coefficient of this product. Right? I bet it's not very nice. Um, it's something to think about. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? So let's say, uh, Richard again. Thanks for all the speakers of the lectures and the uh, Mazatov again, and congr uh, happy birthday to Owen and Pink Val. And see you in a bit for the tips after.